Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Day Drinking with David. Oddly doing so at night. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with y'all. Uh, we're going to have our friends who are drinking during the day from uh, down under. Come on board. See, Sullivan's Cove should be right up. And the internet gods willing, perhaps we will have it. Uh, it's pretty weird doing drinking at night for me. Um, just gonna say that on, you know, on the internet. I'm used to drinking, you know, very low, lo like very much alone at night. Um, but I'm not, so, you know, I'm, I'm with you guys. So we're going to be uh, tasting and touring the exceptional Sullivan's Cove whiskeys, maybe one day, if this comes through. Um, and uh, might, might have broken IG because our, our guest is actually coming in from tomorrow. Uh, Heather, the head distiller, should be here any time now, and uh, unable to join. That's an interesting, fun little, let's try this again. Coming through, I'm sure, any time now. So, um, you know, the old, oh, there it is. Hi. Hey guys, how are you going? You're sideways. Oh, there it is. Yeah, this is so cool. Better, we made it, we didn't oh, break in. This is amazing. <laughs> How's how's Tuesday treating you? Yeah, not bad. Oh, um, well, Monday, I'd reckon um, Monday was shit over here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're so so excited to be with here with you drinking uh, during the day, your day, my night. But um, for us, still like for us, we're um, we're already done a tasting or two today, so <laughs> you're ready to go, huh? <laughs> So Heather, tell us a little bit about Sullivan's Cove, and you know, I, a lot of people don't realize that you guys have been around for like more than twenty years. You're not some little upstart. You know, we're just seeing the brand here in the states become a big deal, but uh, there's a there's a long history there. I'd love to hear a little bit about how how it started. Yeah, cool. Well, so we're in Tasmania, which is uh, a little, quite a small island state on the south part of Australia on the eastern side um, and it's a, it's a pretty small population in Tassie like legitimately maybe 350,000 people statewide so mm -hmm. it's a really tight-knit community. Um, now the, Australia's got quite a, a long distilling history, quite a rich history uh, but Tasmania um, and the rest of Australia were settled uh, you know 200-250 years ago uh, which is pretty recent in comparison to uh, most of the rest of the developed world. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tasmania was settled in the early 1800s. Uh, it prime barley growing land, and so there was barley grown for food, obviously, but also for beer and grog. Uh, and so there was a, a very rife distilling community um, and culture down here back then. Uh, like countless distilleries, booze flinging all left, right, and centre. It became a bit of a social nightmare. And so the government at the time actually put in a prohibition. So that was, I think it was 1838. And so they, they basically prohibited any kind of distillation except for like, you know, outrageously large scale stuff, which meant that in effect, no one could do any distillation. Uh, so no distilling for about 150 years in 1992 when this local bloke was like, yeah, I reckon we'll give it a go. There's peat in peat. A lot of peat bog grows in Tasmania, which obviously is, a, if, if you know a bit about scotch, is a really common sort of way of infusing some flavour and character um, in the process. Uh, and he's like, well, we'll bloody give it a go. And so he, his name was Bill, Bill Lark, and so he um, had the chutzpah to front up to Parliament and uh, say, oi, why don't you, you know, get rid of this outdated prohibition? We don't need it anymore. We're all cool geez. And they said, yeah, no worries. So... Um, <laughs> Then a couple of small, a couple of distilleries started. Then Sullivan's was one of them. Mm. Uh, so that was 1992. Um, Sullivan's started in 1994. Was founded then. So we've got 
about 25 years under our belt. Uh, there's there's a, a few other dozen distilleries in Tasmania, but they're all, they've, they've all kind of just started in the last year. Dozen? So like what, more than? Yes, but I think there's like 50 something licensed stills in Tasmania at the moment. A lot of them are really small operations. So we are tiny right. in the world distilling scheme, but a lot of the, the, the operations here are really cool craft, um, small scale stuff, which is really interesting. Uh, so we're actually one of the bigger ones, uh, but th those ones have started in the, the kind of new wave of distilling that's been happening likewise around the world over the last half a dozen years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have more uh, barrel stock and a bit more experience under our belts. Yeah. And to put it in perspective um, size-wise, um, we fill 350, 400 barrels a year of new make spirit uh, and we've got about 2,000 barrels in our wine store. But if you, to put it into perspective, Buffalo Trace currently has over 7 million barrels under bond. Yeah. So yeah. pretty small. <laughs> well, and, and, and yeah, and I mean, that's, you know, th that's tiny even by Scottish tiny standard. You know, the, yeah. the tiny okay. distilleries in Scotland are doing much more than that even. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and that's really the type, I mean, you're, you're making single malt yep. whiskey very much in the Scottish style with some... Very tweaks uh for sure particular i think in the maturation tell us about how you got to sullivan's and where your your journey into whiskey started and how you're well, yeah how you got here so i am um, i'm not from tasmania i'm from the mainland of australia kind of near sydney mm -hmm. so on the south coast kind of beach girl sort of thing and so i grew up there and uh spent a number of years wine making there uh and after just deciding to move to tasmania I moved here and was trying to get into the wine industry and um, this job came up instead. It just, it, it's a classic small town, small community story of just chatting to a local and then be like, oh, I heard they need a distiller over at Sullivan's Cup. So I, you know, just got in touch and, you know, a couple of days later I had a time distilling role. So uh, awesome. that's, how, but I honestly wasn't really a spirits drinker. Um, until then, I've been big in the wine industry, loving wine, um, but moved to Tasmania and saw very quickly that was a, there was quite a rich craft distilling movement, small scale craft distilling movement, and really loved what I was tasting. So I was thrilled to get involved, and I've been a complete distilling convert ever since, and I love it, very happy. That's interesting. My first love is definitely wine, and I got into this business sort of, you know, not with any particular plans other than to like drink well and and learn a lot and um and it came i was quite young like 22 ish or being very clear that like nobody knew anything about booze in in, in our industry back then this is like 2004 2005 and because i was always interested in whiskey just because i like to drink whiskey so i'd yes. have uh you know wine people come in and and, and ask me like uh, you know, with their master psalm pin on the uh, on the lapel, this Lafrog Lafrog <laughs> from Islay, uh, how is that? Is that quite peaty or no? And you're just like, oh, yeah. so I realized quite early it was just sort of like, there's an opening there. It's an interesting way how people find their way into spirits. And yeah. so you've been there for some time now, though, right? I, I think it's you said yeah. You said. Uh, when did I come in here? 2015, 2016. Yeah, four or five yeah. years. Yep. And now you're you're the head distiller. I mean, you're the. You're I have the... <laughs> well, you must <laughs> be good at it. I mean, distilling is an interesting thing because it's kind of it, it's, you know, when you're head distiller in, in a distillery, you know, you kind of are trying to keep the wheels on right. It yep. makes sure everything is going the way it planned. But of course, you got to do stuff like this. You probably got to pick out casks. You got a million other things to do all the time. You're not just sitting there taking. It's not like in Scotland where you have one guy, he shows up, he takes notes. That's it, yeah. And then he's like, good night. And then, you know, the next guy comes in. It's a, it's, you've got a bigger role. That's it. It's a totally different scale. Um, and there's never a dull moment. So there's, there is obviously like working with the distillers on the floor, you know, figuring out levels and making sure that we're, we're on product specs. Like we're, we're producing the spirit that is us, that Sullivan's yeah. Coke, barrels that we're filling making sure the ferments are all taken care of and they're, they're producing what we want them to. So there's a lot of management kind of things. 
Um, but of course, we, we, you know, we look after our own bond stores, so there's always barrels to move around, samples to take, samples to taste, uh, barrels to decant, barrels to fill. Um, so we're, we're nice and busy here, which is nice. I like it. I like not being so detached as uh, many distillery managers in Scotland are and in the sense that uh, they, they have distillers who are sitting in front of a screen running the like 10 stills at once. Um, whereas we've got one still and it's it's user intensive and it's kind of intimate. It's well, fun. can we talk a little bit about the, the details there? So tell us a little bit, you're using um, mostly, I mean, it's not super peated barley or are you, is there peat? You, you do, no peat, no. So no peat on the barley, air dried. And uh, tell us a little bit, you're, you're fermenting in, I don't know that much about the details. Um, you're fermenting in, uh, what, what, how, what, tell us about how the fermentation works over there. So it's, I mean, Whiskey, in essence, is distilled beer in a, in a rudimentary kind of way. Yeah. I mean, you don't boil the wort. Uh, you want it to be kind of raw and fresh and funky. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's really basic, right? So malted barley, yeast and water. Mm -hmm. We have a very particular um, yeast profile that we use that gives us a very particular new make that has, you know, formed the basis of our brand. Uh, so we'll monitor that. Uh, ferment quite closely. You, you're lottering though, like a like a normal. You have a like a mash tun and your proper lottering and all that stuff. Yeah, so mash tun, lot all this very similar to brewing beer, uh, except you're not adding hops and you're not boiling the wort. Right. Uh, once you know, once it's attenuated, once you've reached the the ABV and you've aged it off a little bit, you literally just let step away. <laughs> let it go. That's it. Yeah. So it's cool. it's kind of pure in that way it's it's, yeah. it's somewhat easy like i mean it's every brewer's dream uh, to, to be brewing for for a still how um, long is is typical fermentation there 120 hours okay so it's really yeah yeah. Uh, yeah so that's and you know most most scotch most scotch distilleries will do really short fermentations purely these days for the sake of yield and like annual new make yield that you can just run as many cycles through as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's all about fast ferments and fast yeasts and whatnot. Um, but I mean, back in the day, it wasn't like that, you know, you, you yeah. brew it, you get a really rich, rich flavorful textural spirit. And so that's what we do now. I found no matter what Scottish distillery you go to, they'll say, yes, we have a very long fermentation. You're like, what? Two hours. 36 hours, like, what? They were, they were doing a 180 at the last place. And yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I went up to, um, you know, these guys up in Doorknock, the uh, Thompson brothers, uh, tiny little guys. And they're all about like recreating this um, dead style where they're pitching in old beer yeast that they get from like the local. And we showed up and they had this freaking thing going in there. And they're like, oh yeah, we went on vacation to Spain. And we're back two weeks later. I think this one's ready to go. You're like, you <laughs> left this fermenting up by itself. Yeah. And they're like, perfect. It, we're spot on. You're like, all right. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. But I love it. I've, I've um, been to some Scottish distilleries that that le that age their wash on purpose. Uh, mm. for, and certainly not, not all of their wash is aged because obviously then they would only be able to produce half of what they do in a year. But um, yeah, for certain brands and styles, they'll be aging their wash. Uh, you know, like the good old days. Yeah, that's, yeah, not a lot of people doing that any longer, though. Oh, yeah. it's time, time, money, money, money. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And then uh, into a typical um, Scottish style pot still, or are we, no? No, no, no. Um, I'll, I'll do a walk around in a minute. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, can't wait. But we actually distill in uh, Charente Alambic, which. Oh, cool. That's made in. So it's a brandy still. Um, which is not the normal uh, by any stretch of the measure. And I think it, it does give us a very particular uniqueness in our spirit. Uh, so really cool. Uh, obviously, most of the stills in Australia are based on the Scottish style. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are locally made in Tasmania or in Australia, uh, but they're, uh, they're kind of made after the Scotch style. Uh, whereas ours, as you'll see, is, looks like a... a somewhat uh, tweaked out cognac still. We call it the Franken still now. It used to be a rep, but we've done things, so. That's great. Well, and I, yeah, I mean, God, that, you know, 
the sh the still shape is like still the most controversial of all the the parts of distillation. You know, yes. one distillery you go, oh, it's got to be. You know, they recreate the 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 bump when you know when they redo it, and then you'll go somewhere else, and they'll be like, yeah, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's all the same. It's the fermentation times and distillation speed, and voila, yep. tastes the same. You're like, well. I don't know. I never know who to trust in this industry. You know, like an industry that's that swears that non-chill filtered stuff tastes the same as chill filtered stuff. And you're just like, you guys are fooling yourselves, but whatever, it's fine. But, um, I think that like one of the, my favorite things about this, it's not just distilling, but it's about, you know, wine and beer and creating fermented beverages is that every single part of the process, I believe, has an impact. Yeah. And it not only not only on the end result, but on every other process that happens around it, you know. Totally. Uh, so I think the still absolutely has a big part to play. Just like you said, just like the the yeast, the fermentation time, you know, temperature throughout the whole thing. I, I think everything plays a really big part, and it's very much the terroir uh, conversation. Uh, that's something that I wish more spirits producers would talk about, uh, because whiskey, like all spirits is a product of agriculture. Yeah. We talk yeah. about wine, you know, the, the help our conversation is very French and it's very wine, mm. it's all of beverages, but it really comes down to every single element of that place and the soul of the people and their input. And uh, so every, everything matters. Yeah, and I mean, even down to like the barley strain, that's something that's so, so skipped over now in modern scotch and um you know i i think uh obviously not to say bar you know what you distill necessarily will have a flavor difference because of the barley strain but you're gonna get a different process regard you know certain barleys have more protein have more sugar have more what, what have you so yeah uh, i think it's always gonna be it might not be massive but for you process that you'll pick it up there's a, there is a slight character difference uh, when when you're distilling off different different strains. So we're using. Uh, I mean, I guess the cool thing about the Tasmanian whiskey industry is that we're really just piggybacking off the brewing industry that was thriving, because of course the prohibition on distillation didn't affect the beer industry whatsoever. So beer and wine have been quite a thing here, and then we come along in the early '90s and say, well, hey, we've got a still, you know, <laughs> we can. Do Let's do That's something. Plenty That's of beer. Um, and so obviously we're, we're distilling off pretty much old school brewing strains, uh, which have less starch. They've got more <laughs> fat, like, like, you know, building blocks for flavour and texture uh, than just purely existing for a nice flavour and lots of yield. So the wash that we distill is, you know, 73 7.4%. Closer to ten, or a little bit past it. Oh yeah, um, but certainly um, in it for the flavor, in it for the texture. Yeah. Yeah, you need those lipids, uh, and the, and yeah, the other thing, uh, the other thing that they don't talk about a lot in Scotland is that sort of that that souring step that happens with the sort of open fermentation. Um, if you don't boil, obviously you're going to have some lacto element yep. i think that's a huge huge important part um and then and then maturation the final piece well besides of course blending of course you're you're probably using some tasmanian wine barrels no or because it's i do see the american oak of course that's 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 classic that's uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so we've obviously got um a lot of our barrels being filled into ex-bourbon casks so they're coming from you guys in the states yes uh, also feeling predominantly Australian ex tawny casks. Uh, so they're from the mainland predominantly. Oh, We've got yeah. of, uh, big wine producing regions in the mainland Australia yeah. that also fortified wine. So the Barossa is one of them in South Australia. That's the main one. Uh, so tawny, uh, for those out there not familiar, it's uh, an Australian version of a port style wine. So it's fortified, mm -hmm. varietal grapes, uh, fortified and nice and sweet and uh, thick, you know, dried fruit, molassesy, nutty. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, so there's a very particular style of Australian fortified uh, and the barrels that we uh, then fill uh, from like with our new make uh, 
from those ex fortified casks are just gorgeous. Uh, it's uh, the, the sherry style whiskies that you, you find in Scotland, particularly, it's, it's actually interesting. They're quite different from yeah. the, the and because tawny and sherry are quite unique. I mean, she, yeah. sherry is much sweeter and broader, whereas tawny's quite dusty. It's got a really classic dusty, almost like Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, big, mm. big, big red fruits, quite luscious, uh, well, really. Someone, so, wa someone noted watching, and that's why I assume that you were a very typical in Australian whiskey to, to see the wine barrels. And I, I think uh, you're, you know, um, you're probably smart. I, I, I don't think, especially in a, in a massive form, that uh, dry wine is all, especially in French oak, is always giving the best environment for um, for single malts necessarily. It can make think, great whiskey. I think uh, there's a very, as you say, you've got dry red wine already big in the tannin front, put into a French oak barrel, heavy in tannin, um, yeah. and then putting, a, you know, 63, 64% spirit in there for, in our case, it'd be like, you know, at least a decade. Yeah. Uh, they end up with a lot of dry spirit. But I, I think there's a nap. Um, but the, the wine casts that we filled are white wine, so Chardonnay based. Mm. Uh, and we've had some great results. French oak, little 225 litre barrique, um, ex Chardonnay casks. And they, uh, they actually give a gorgeous fruit salad delicacy. Yeah. But beautiful, safe herbal note as well. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to wine casts in general. I just think it's 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 more difficult to use than the obvious this thing I think like that. Uh, you've got to be very careful with it. It can um, you can over extract the tannin really easily. Yeah. So where's the Chardonnay coming from then? Uh, that's predominantly the Barossa as well. Although we have also filled some Tasmanian Chardonnay and Pinot Noir casks as well. This Pinot Noir is a great varietal that's that's very much at home in Tasmania. Yeah, huge uh, fan of the Tassie Pinots. Those are. Yeah, good Tassi Pinot and Tassi Chardonnay, they're the, the two main bottles grown here because we've got a cooler climate down yeah. in Tassie. Yeah. Very cool. Well, and uh, and uh, warehousing, are, are you are you using Dunn style or you have a racking house? I mean, it must be, it's quite cool there. Yeah. You know, most of the um, time. Right? Yes, well, we're using Dunnage, um, but just for pragmatic reasons and just for the safety of our staff, we, we have gone over to the, the metal racking. It means you can mm -hmm. access really easily etc but the climate here is an interesting point uh, is that in Tasmania we are a lot cooler in general than the mainland uh, of Australia uh, particularly the coastal areas uh, so like our average winter temperatures are like low to 10 sort of thing um, we'll get down to, to zero one frequently in winter yeah. a lot of Heaps and heaps of snow in, in, in the inside of the island part. And summer, there'd be maybe a handful of days at 30. Uh, whereas compared to the rest of Australia, it gets a lot. <laughs> yeah. But is, it, is it very humid? Or you have a lot no. of rain in the summers? No, it's dry. Dry. So uh, our, our uh, maturation climate is a lot more akin to Kentucky, to mm. Bourbon, than it is to Scotland. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's an interesting sort of somewhere in between for maturation. Uh, we're maturing here for long periods of time at Sullivan's. We're using full size casks uh, and we're letting them sit. We don't touch them um, just for the odd, see how, see how they're going kind of thing. But we don't start tasting them with, with the view to seeing, you know, when they come through until they're eight or nine years old. Wow. So we're releasing whiskies that are somewhere between 10 or 11 and 20. Uh, years old in a climate that's that somewhere hot and that one that's okay. backwards but we got 17 yeah. to taste later i'm very excited for that uh cool well let's take um if you don't mind a quick walk around the distillery and check it out not a problem uh, so i'll around and we'll do a tour oh uh, bourbon bites asks are we getting some sullivan's products soon here at knl they are, are for sale i think we sold out of the double cask the double oak uh this week, but uh, yeah, just 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 uh, search Sullivan's on the site. You should see them there, and uh, we'll have all three available today or tomorrow. They they should be back in stock. Um, but yes, they are very much available. Beauty. So uh, here we are in uh, downtown Cambridge. That's a little suburb of Hobart. Um, 
see, it's really beautiful. Um, <laughs> we're just in yeah. a bit better, a nice little industrial area, which has got room for us. Um, so I'm just going to take you on a walk. We'll go up the top of the mezzanine because then we can look down on the still, have a peek at Myrtle. Myrtle's the name of the still. Every still has a lady's name. Okay, so here we go. This is just one of our warehouses. This is the one that holds the still. You can oh, see we've got in here as well. That's the stainless steel racking we we're talking about. This is Myrtle. Oh, gorgeous. So two, two and a half thousand litre pot still. Uh, we've got here the uh, reflux ball, boiling ball, onion neck, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's the, as you can see, there's uh, quite a, a wide flange at the, the base of it. So you get a lot of the vapors just flying up there. And uh, there's a much more narrow flange at the top. So there's a traffic jam of, of vapors condensing. And so it actually makes it quite hard for the vapors to make their way up. Mm. That's a lot, given the size of the still, make their way up and all the way over the swan's neck. Nice little decline here down the line um, into the worm tub condenser, which is quite an old school style condenser. You yeah. can see the, see the coil in there. So Love basically it. we've got some chillers out the, out the back with water reservoirs in them. And that keeps chilled water circulating circulating through the the condenser tub there which chills the vapors inside the the coil and then they come trickling out that's sorry there we go she's running all right look at that out. just trying to get a better angle yeah so that's the our new make we are on a spirit run so it's coming out uh the nice little rate and yeah. we've got these cream tanks here that are receivers for various low wines or spirit at different stages of the, the process. Um, yeah, so we, we run the still low and slow. That's uh, our MO to really maximize that reflux, like condensing and vaporizing cycle in here, which means that, you know, the harder you make it for the vapors to get up, it means that only the lighter, uh, you know, more, more favorable, very light kind of honey, fruity compounds get through. You, you leave the heavy ones behind. And you're doing both the wash and the spirit on the... Uh, we are. Yep, Myrtle does a lot. We do. We've just got one still. So you, we ah. um, do the wash still, uh, the wash runs and the spirit runs in Myrtle. So she's got a common still, common coil, uh, which is a very uh, unique feature. Um, yeah. We don't have a separate still. Um, That's a so, lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. She's running around the clock. She, uh, she runs seven days a week. You and should. we would... Sorry. Go sorry. Go Oh, no, I was just going to just to say, you know, she runs seven days a week and I've uh, already mentioned we fill about 350, 400 barrels a year. So, yeah, um, she's busy, um, but she's a happy girl. <laughs> kidding. She's gorgeous. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, uh, you said steam, steam to, to distill? Um, you... Electric. So electric. you can see the electric box in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's just a bunch of elect electric uh, elements through the base and we can control pretty accurately uh very with pin, with pinpoint accuracy uh the the heat that goes in the rate it goes in mm -hmm. um because obviously the whole thing about distilling is to have a really controlled boil in the way that will give you the spirit that you want at the end of the day so um that works quite well for us at the moment i have someone asking if if you ever in, it, plan to increase capacity i assume that if you haven't done it in the first 20 years maybe in the second <laughs> uh look i mean it's not off the table, not off the cards by any stretch of the measure. But I think with a brand like ours, uh, the main thing is that we don't compromise on, you know, the, the, the spirit style that we have, the maturation style that we have. So if we were going to, uh, we certainly would do it um, very considered. And, uh, mm. yeah, like, I mean, we our scale is really small. So yeah. it, it probably, I don't think it would take much to sort of uh, compromise on that, on that quality. Yeah. 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 Where is fermentation occurring? Fermentation occurs uh, at a brewery down the road. Oh, cool. Uh, so we contract. We contract brew. Um, so we work really closely with a local brewer um, to, to get a very specific wash that's literally, they, they've got tanks just for us. So it's, it's a really cool partnership that we have with a, a brewery called Last Rites. Um, you can see over in the background as well while we're here, 
all these tanks, um, they are settling whiskey. So whiskey that we have decanted, uh, also some brandy, but mainly mainly single malt. Uh, and we are slowly, slowly, slowly diluting them mm -hmm. to bottling strength, an appropriate bottling strength, uh, which we decide for each batch. So with the maturation stage, uh, it's we don't have timing, you know, alarm bells that go off and say, oh, you know, this this whiskey now has to go into our 10 year old or whatever. Uh, it's literally every barrel is uh, tasted quarterly, like with the seasons, mm. um, once it reaches nine years old. And uh, when we think it's hot to trot, uh, we will decant it. That could be 10 years old. It could be 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, whatever. Uh, the whiskey, we believe the whiskey tells you when it's ready. Uh, so we'll we'll gently decant it and we'll sit down here uh, just for a for a little minute uh, bubbling away with its water and uh, then we we move on through to the bottling room. I'll give you a peek there just yeah. while we're at it. What's the um who who's the team to to make those decisions? Uh, obviously you're on it. Is it a, is it a large group of people or is it a small select group? How's it going? A small group of people. Um, obviously I'm on it. Um, so we've got like all of the distillers are part of that group mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, we've got the, the, the small front of house crew here as well that are part of that group. Um, but there's usually only three or four of us in any one day. Just going to give you a walk around Myrtle while we're here. Someone's asking how the brandy is going. Uh, Brandy's going well. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't realize you guys were doing that. I'm super psyched to taste that one day. Yeah, uh, about a decade. Oh, actually, probably more than a decade now. I'm um, probably about 12, 13 years ago. Um, we distilled bunch of local wines great and um hi guys this is the bottling room i'm coming back to brandy hi everybody hey. you're live <laughs> <laughs> so this is our tiny little bottling room awesome um, really handmade totes done by hand so you can see this is the thing we call the octopus even though it's only got four tentacles that doesn't really matter um so really small scale in the bottle Oh yeah, gorgeous. Putting into the, the boxes here. Tammy's wrapping for postage. This is Cam, he's chucking the bottles in. Hi Cam. Oh, Howdy Cam. <laughs> yeah, so really, really small scale. Thank you. What's, uh, but with Brandy, oh sorry, go on. Sorry, no, no, let's talk about Brandy. I just, this question will wait. What, tell me, so you're, you're distilling local wine, finished wine. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah, wine. Um, as you know, as you would for any with, with beer, but um, yeah, like I mean, brandy is distilled wine, um, as whiskey is distilled beer. Uh, yeah. So we had an opportunity to distill some Tasmanian, uh, predominantly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and uh, did a bloody good job of it, if I don't say so myself, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> chucked it in um, in true Sullivan style into. Uh, some X20 casks, French Oak, uh, Australian X20 casks. Cool. Uh, and the results have been really gorgeous. Uh, I mean, I'm a cognac and an Armagnac fan from way back. Um, so it, uh, obviously just intrigued by it all and love it. Um, and so stylistically, it is typically Australian. It's just a bigger version, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tell yeah, Freddie's got to bring one of those when, they're, when he's allowed to travel, when he's allowed to leave yeah. Melbourne. One day, uh, yeah. One day, 2022. Uh, well, this has been so cool. Thank you so much for your time. Let's, 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 um, what I was going to ask you earlier was, uh, I, I, I assume your primary market is, is Australia, of course. Um, yep. But uh, we're so happy to see them in the States. Are you guys kind of going all over right now? Or is it mostly Australia, Europe, and um, where are you? Thanks, Fred. I, I appreciate that. Uh, are you um, are you are you guys on a conscious push to sort of bring Sullivan's to the world, or just sort of tiptoeing out? Tell us a little bit about the plans. Yeah, we're definitely in a conscious push, but in a small way. Uh, I mean, we we don't produce much, and uh, we don't bottle much. That's mm. the other. There is a domino effect of having to wait, like you know, average fifteen years sort of thing uh, before you can bottle something and and sell it so we've only got to sell what we distilled 10 15 years ago which is uh so we're the most part our sales are domestic 
uh, but we do trickle it out of the States to, to Europe to the UK. Yeah. Awesome. So should we have a little whiskey then? Sounds good. Hell yeah. Uh, I've got the American Oak single cask here. One thing yeah. I love about what you guys do is that every bottle has this little, you can't really see it on a stinking yeah. Instagram. This is just all the information that us nerds desperately crave about the whiskey. So this is barrel TD0230. Yep. One of 241 bottles filled on the uh, 29th of December. Oh, someone working basically New Year's 2007 and bottled into 2018. That's uh, all there. Yeah, I agree. I think that the side tags are really cute. So clutch. Beautiful color. So 100% American oak. So you're, you're, this is a true single barrel selection. You guys are, uh, I, I assume, um, tasting a lot of these. It's probably a fun part of the job, huh? It's um, not bad. <laughs> Yeah, we taste most days. Yeah. Um, obviously, you got to be, you got to be realistic. I mean, you, you get palate fatigue, and so we'll do about a dozen, uh, half a dozen samples a day at yeah. a time. Um, we got to do other things in the day as well. Totally. Uh, but obviously, we're looking, we're, we're scanning the, all, all of the barrels that are over nine, like see, like every quarter, basically. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't take long before there's significant change. And so we like to just constantly have our fingers on the pulse of each barrel and kind of follow each one's narrative because a lot of the whiskies that we release are single cask, single barrel releases. Yeah. Uh, so need to know where they're all at. It's almost like you've got a, you know, a, it's like a schoolhouse of kids, right? You're just sort of watching them, monitoring where, where each is each of that. Yeah. And, um, Let them loose on the world. The double is quite an important product for you, though, though guys. I, I'm sad we don't have it to taste because it feels like I, it sort of, in a lot of ways, exemplifies. Yeah, you like that? Sullivan's in a Westward glass. Um, it's uh, cross craft cultural here, but uh, the um, uh, the double. Yeah, tell us about how you do that. That uh, the double cast. So, the double. like like what we're tasting now, we've got the single cast. So that is literally one barrel. So a couple hundred bottles sort of thing, one barrel. Fingerprint of nature, can't repeat it. They're, they're, the barrels of a, a type are all very similar and recognisable. We're putting our same spirit into them, but each one is, you know, it has its own nuance. Um, with the double cask, it's mm -hmm. not a blend. It's a single malt, uh, but we're basically taking bits and bobs, like portions of no more than 10 barrels, so it's quite small. Uh, and marrying them together in a blending kind of exercise. So it's not a blend, do the blending exercise, put them together if that makes sense. So you know, trying to pick, pick and choose from certain casks to, to marry together to give balance, to give complexity, good texture, to give that narrative um, that, that we're all after in a dram. It is the idea to have sort of a consistent Sullivan's Co profile across batches or to like do something different every time? Is that, I mean, I like to tell people, all whiskey, unless it's single barrel, is blended whiskey. You know, people you know, people don't really get that, but at, because we have this sort of Scotch way of looking at things. Um, but any distillery that's putting more than one barrel together is making decisions about how the whiskey is going to taste, because the sum of the parts do not equal the whole necessarily. Um, so anyway, what's the what's the goal of that program? Is it is it that consistency uh, or? It is about consistency in that. Uh, when I'm putting the blends blends together, that's I should stop saying that. <laughs> it's because I do the size. But when I put the, the, the DCs, the double cast together, it is like in my mind there's a product spec. There's a there's a particular Sullivan's Cove double cast brand character that I have to achieve. Each batch is definitely unique. It's just like, because at a scale at which we're doing it, there is no way, there is absolutely no way that you'd be able to achieve like scotch style consistency right. at all molecularly physically cannot doesn't happen uh, i mean the, the double cast uh, batches that we put together
Uh, sorry, I just had a call and I just declined oh, yeah. it. <laughs> uh, the, the double cast batches that we put together at the most would be like 1400 bottles each, uh, oh. which is really small scale. Yeah, tiny. Uh, so yes, after consistency for us, for our style, mm -hmm. but that does look a little bit different with each batch. Oh, this is so good, by the way. Oh my God, I don't even want to. I'm like, the one good thing about drink day drinking at night is that I don't have anything else to do today. So now I'm now I can just drink my whiskey and be done with it. Um, that's really interesting. And 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 the double cask refers to the two cask types that are used in the blend, right? That's the the. But, the that's yeah. So typically it will be those two main cask types that we use we fill. So it's the French and the American oak ex bourbon. Um, we have kind of been branching out and broadening it out because it is, it is also a beautiful thing about the double cask is that it is a collection of what we've got available. Um, mm. as, but that we don't just have those barrels, the, the French oak tawny and the American oak bourbon in our bond store. We've also got American oak and tawny casks, French oak white wine casks. And so they, they do kind of slip in there here and there into the double cask. But by far the majority is the French oak tawny and the, the American oak ex bourbon. Interesting. First fills, there's some second fills in there as well. Uh, so I, I have a lot of fun. I really love putting the double casks together. Uh, just as much, honestly, as finding a single cask because it's um, it's it's two two completely different processes. Uh, but at the end of the day, you are seeking for balance. You're seeking complexity. You're seeking a gorgeous nose. It mm. feels it fills the palate of the nose, palate on like in the mouth, finished, really gorgeous. Nose. You're after the same thing, that spirit that reflects our distillery. Someone's asked if, if equal time in French and American oak, and I think that's probably impossible because you're going to be picking and choosing different things to, to fit a profile that you're kind of imagining so yep. it can change any time. I would say for the, for the double cast, the average age would be 11, uh, but the cast portions that I put in, they'd range from probably nine years to 13 or 14 years old. Wow. Uh, good question. Yeah, so they, each, each component will be a different age. Mm. Yeah, because we, we, when we decant a barrel, it's when we know it's ready for its purpose. So it's, it's ready to go straight into a single cast like this guy, um, mm -hmm. or we decided that it's, not, it's just not going to be one of those barrels that needs to be centre stage and needs to be the centre of attention. It needs its best place as a team player. Um, it just might not have that kind of extra, uh, I don't know, pizzazz, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, complexity and balance that um, single casks have, which, to be honest, it's a freak of nature when single casks happen beautifully. It's yeah. Well, it this one's there. Oh, it's all gone now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, um, to let them figure it out themselves, it's you, it really does feel like you're kind of a custodian. And I love I, I love the way you guys have this sort of aesthetic that it definitely feels different. It, it feels tazzy to me. It, it, this is it, a lot of ways is the quintessential whiskey of, uh, you know, and, and Lark, of course, which is a great distillery as well. But it's, it's got the, you know, it's got a, 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 a soul from down under with, with all the, 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 the accoutrement of, of a great single malt from Scotland. But it's really, really interesting stuff. And, you know, just the fact that you guys can put 17 year old whiskey out from a tiny little craft distillery, that's, just, I mean, economically outrageous, uh, and, <laughs> and people don't realize. I mean, obviously, this product is wildly expensive, as it as it should be, and uh, and you know, I think it compares up to, you know, the very expensive whiskeys from 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 Scotland, of course, um, and and but is in, in its own right, um, it, its own thing. And uh, tell us about these older casks and how you how you thought all this. Well, these older casks are, um, they're very special. So we, uh, we're cautious. You know, we, we definitely, um, you get nervous when you're tasting them. I think, oof, is this one today? Mm. You know, one of those days that we're going to stumble across a, a really old guy that's um, ready to go. Um, they, they're really interesting in that they are so textural. They're beautiful. They're so textural. You'll feel it just voluptuously kind of lolling, lolling around your mouth, a gorgeous, creamy, nice 
I'm with, feeling like, oh my God. Wow. It's a different <laughs> level. It's it's interesting you said that 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 dichotomy in between the 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 climate of Kentucky and 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 Scotland because sorry. It is it is starting to give us some of those some of those exotic flavors of a great bourbon. Um, also some of the tropicality of an old, very old single malt too, which is really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I think that the climate, like we're dry here. So we're not like the climates that are quite humid. And so there is a different interaction that goes on chemically in the barrels over yeah. its age. It, as you know, whiskey buffins out there will know, the, the alcohol percentage in the barrel in Scotland actually drops. Yeah. Uh, because of the climate, whereas in Kentucky and we're the same here, it rises. So it is not uncommon for one, for us to, to decant one of these barrels. I mean, like particularly these, like a 17-year-old, and it will be almost 80%. Jesus Christ, that is nuts. That's at least the, the mid-70s, uh, which is, that's hot, that's yeah. high. So yeah. you've already got a whole host of chemical reactions, interactions with the barrel and spirit aren't happening in scotch and so the the australian sort of single malt whiskey is, is it is you're right there's a really interesting dichotomy between the climate of scotch and, and bourbon and so there is nuances of both we yeah. do have the interesting leathery dark vanilla stuff that you get in your gorgeous old bourbons um but yeah. carmen miranda's fruit hat you know it's yeah. <laughs> fruit, fruit right. bowl. uh you're, you said you're going in around 63 is that typical yep typical Totally and, and in terms of volume loss, alcohol and water, what's your sort of average in a barrel? I mean, uh, look, I mean, like we kind of use the term angel share. I think that's used the globe round in spirits or so. And we could be losing roughly like 8% a year. Uh, that's not uncommon. Obviously, the, the, the further along down the, the geriatric ward you get, um, you lose more. Right. Uh, yeah. So a barrel of 17 year at 80 or 75 percent alcohol you're still only getting you know a couple hundred bottles out of there yeah so yeah. i mean that in barrels like that like a 17 year old 200 liter ex-urban asd cask would typically be half empty wow yeah oh i'm sorry i was picking the wrong way 160 out of that yeah with, with with the dilution so you're you know you probably what had there was probably even, a hundred I mean, liters of, of wow, spirit. Yep. Do you ever right. bottle at full cast strength or is it just too intense? <laughs> We've done a few. Yeah. Uh, it, it is super, super intense, um, as you can imagine. Uh, and I think um, it's You know not all these geeks are going to want it now. They're like, I want the 80 proof, I know. the 80% well, yeah. alcohol. Yeah, it's, it's totally for our spirits and drinks geeks, absolutely. Uh, it's not for everyone. So we have done a few and we just have been very careful about how we've um, released them. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that you want to just give to the bottle shops and have someone pick it off the shelf and then have a couple of drams and holy moly, that was 75%. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have done a couple in recent years, but we tend not to. Uh, to be honest, we're really picky. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you're searching for a cask that you're going to release at, cast strength undiluted you kind of got to assume that a lot of the time people are going to add water and so you want want to make sure that that whisk stands up all the way down yeah uh, with water added um it, you know it's it's one thing for a barrel to be absolutely beautiful at 72 percent but if you know between 65 and 49 percent it's a little bit flat or dull then i don't really see the point of putting it in a cast strength bottling that people are going to pay a premium for because you want it to be an absolute ripper. I don't know. You know, the, uh, the, those degenerate bourbon drinkers, they never add water to their whiskey. So you'll, you, you can count on that. Sell it to Americans. We'll just shoot it and call it a day. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, there we go. I will never add water. The whiskey is amazing as is. Voila. I, yeah. uh, I'm a big water man. I like, I, I, even if I prefer whiskey straight out of the bottle or even cast strength, I always spend the time, you know, as I go through a bottle to add water just to see what happens. I think it's fun to, to see whiskey react to, to water. And, and, and the case, you know, on a hot day, you want to, you know, something more air pair of you know, toss a, yeah. toss a little more, you know, big deal. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't 
when I'm drinking to enjoy, I uh, I don't add water at all. Um, I'm okay if it's in the high 60s, that's fine. But um, certainly, like, when you want to get your go-go gadget investigator eye on, then water's the best way to do it. A drop at a time. Mm. It's all of a whiskey. And you, you just, I, I do know. tend to drink a lot of cast strength single malt, so that, that lends itself to, to, to adding water. Our good yep. friend Denver, who you probably know, <laughs> Uh, he's asking if there are any core expression expansions for what's the few uh, sorry what's the future of the core expressions for Sullivan's will they uh, always be around Denver asks inquisitively they'll always be around oh, God. so I mean that core range I mean, we don't have it all here today but we have double cast which we've been speaking about that kind of married blend it's not a blend um, it's single malt so we've got the double cask and we've got the single cask American ask American oak ex bourbon cask like this uh we do in the single cask french oak ex tawnies uh we've also brought into our range in more recent years american oak ex tawnies uh we've played around with a couple of refill labels where we're we're actually saying look this is a delicious whiskey but it's it's second fill so it's not going to have intensity that you're all you guys are used to um with the core range uh first fill single casks mm. uh, got the special cask label green job uh, that's for when we just find a cask that is astounding an absolute ripper uh, it might not fit into those the other kind of main core expressions but put it in a green label if that's the case and we have the old and red range which uh, is the french oak single cask the american oak single cask, but they're really old and we just yeah. want to highlight them. they're really old and <laughs> this australia does not have a massive spirit distilling industry like craft barrel aged spirits Tasmania is tiny, we are tiny. Um, so the rarity of those spirits is profound and absolutely worth pointing out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 to be honest, the quality, I mean, there 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 aren't a lot of drinks that, that can, can do this. And I think you. if you're ever gonna um, you know treat yourself like this is just as good as a, a choice as any um, top class ultra premium spirit out there. So uh, this has been so much fun, Heather. I could sit and drink with you on the internet indefinitely, but I'm gonna let you go. And uh, well, I, let, well, I guess we should open up. We still have a bunch of people watching. Get, uh, so any questions for Heather or uh, myself before we call it quits? I know Denver can talk all night. That's no question about that. Uh, no, up, uh, up. Uh. I think everybody's happy, happy, and okay. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much, Heather. I can't wait to do this in Pleasure. Tasmania with you, clink, clinking glasses. This has been so fun, and we're so happy to be selling these awesome whiskeys. Everybody, buy your Sullivan's Cove, klwines.com. Uh, oh, we do have questions. Are the casts, yeah, all the casts are full size. Yes, they are, uh, very, very full size. What is Denver's favorite Sullivan's? <laughs> oh. Now, we, where did all these questions come from? I, we, they were all stopped up. Uh, I look forward to visiting Sullivan someday. Okay, not a question, but close. Ha Heather, what would you? Uh, uh, what would you? What would you do with Dave when he finally? Uh, had the well, drink with me. Drink. Uh, we'd go drink, drink some wine too. Whiskey and wine. There's some nice local beer. Um, we actually have a really cool food scene in, in Hobart, tiny little town. Um, Hobart's the capital where we're based. But it's a really, really cool uh, tourism-based, uh, you know, food, alcohol, and arts culture. Great. So it's great. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a place to live and be. Beer fishing. <laughs> that sounds like my <laughs> dream come true. What the hell is beer fishing? We thing. can do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, my kid's, of course, obsessed with Tasmanian Devil. He does not believe it's real. Um, he doesn't he, look like he, he, he can't believe it. He, he swears it's extinct. And it might be soon, which is terrible news. But let's, let's, let's save that old, that old Tasm Tassie Devil. And uh, <laughs> to you, Heather, and, and everybody else at Sullivan's Cove, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very uh, much. We'll and see you soon. Cheers. See you later. Bye.